Hey, yo, it's your boy Marathon the Chain, aka Macaroni Tony. We are at Taste Cribs. Cause it moves outside the bodega, bodega, bodega. I got oh. Um, I started taking music seriously when I realized that uh, people were listening. And not only listening, but I was touching other people. Like, people were able to relate to stories I had about myself. So I thought that was like really cool. And that was able like, people were reaching out telling me how, um, however, my music was changing their life or helping get through a dark time. And I just thought that was dope because for me, it was just to help me like get through my own shit. So when it started touching other people, I realized I really had a voice or I was speaking for people who couldn't do what I do. Um, and just, and I also had fun actually making the music. So it was just something that, uh, I decided I'm gonna I'm try to see how far I can go with this because at the time I was like really in love with drawing. I just wanted to make art. But once I, I had fun in the studio, I had fun seeing the feedback and people loving it and stuff like that. And I was always good with, uh, with words, period, because English was my favorite subject. So once I started getting the feedback and people were like, yo, just keep on making it because it's helping me through a time that I need right now. And that's pretty much what drove me to keep doing it. Word. So yeah. what song, what was the first song that you really started getting traction with? Um, the first song I really started getting traction with was a song called Pam. I did that like 2014. And it was a song about um, TV show Martin. Uh, it was kind of a flip on what people know about the show. It was about if uh, if you watch the show, you know Martin and Pam. Pam is uh, Gina's best friend, Gina's his girlfriend. So they always cracking on each other. That's kind of like their back and forth. But it's certain episodes, if you really watch the show, where they're kind of like, a little too close for that to be like your girl's best friend, y'all little, you know what I mean? Like, it was glimpses of that though. So I kind of played on that and took it like, what if the whole time they're just cracking jokes on each other to kind of hide the fact that they're really messing around behind closed doors? Like, yo, they hate each other in public, but behind the closed doors, they really get it in behind Gina's back. So that song kind of turned into an entire album just based off of that concept and how that would throw like a monkey wrench into the whole plot <clears throat> of Martin. So I guess that creativity, that idea, the fact that a lot of people know the show, um, got me a lot of notoriety. Like a lot of people, like just started like, oh, this kid's different. Like he's not just rapped about the same old thing. I just took a concept that's never been done before, and I pretty much made it my own. And I got a lot of fans just off of that. Yeah. Definitely. So how did you and like Southside come together? Um, that's the that's the squad. Yeah. Yes, South, Southside. <laughs> me and Southside got together. Um, I was making music on my own. Um, in Camden, just in my city. I was just trying to make a name for myself in my city. And I had met Ish, and I respected what Ish was doing. Ish was one of those people that was like always dropping music. He was real consistent, but he didn't quite have his sound yet. Like he was, uh, he was at that time he was always making a bunch of songs just about weed. Like it was a whole bunch of like weed songs. I think Wiz Khalifa was really popping at that time. So I was like, you don't want to put yourself in a box and become like a stoner rapper, you know? Like you have the ability to actually do something bigger than that. So it was kind of like we were giving each other advice back and forth, and we would motivate each other and that ultimately led me to uh, him introducing me to Kev at the time he was a little D beats and I didn't have a producer that's really where I thought that's the only thing I need is a producer I need an in-house producer somebody that can make what I hear how in my head beats? I was huh how are you like how I was never really getting beats I was getting them off of YouTube or I would get them on SoundCloud or sound I think SoundClick was still around but it wasn't that popping at the time so it was like all right I have an idea in my head I was getting to the point where I'm making music so now I know what I want as opposed to let me hear a beat and then make something from the beat. So now I know what I want to hear and it was a, it was kind of like, now that I know what I want to hear, I gotta go on YouTube and hope that something's close to what I hear. And that was corny after a while and I got tired of doing that. So Ish introduced me to Kev and I think Ish had to go bust a trap real quick and he just left me at Kev's crib. Like you ever just meet somebody and then you just alone with this person now, like we just met and we had, it was just like, we was just sitting there, I'm just sitting there in his room, and at that time, we was making all our music in Kev's room. Um, he had a little microphone stand right next to his computer, and you had to go to the, uh, usually go to the closet, close the closet, and that'd be your little booth. But um, I had an idea for a song called Biggie Papa at that time, and I needed a beat to sound like this and sound like that, and I just kind of like tested Kev to see what he can do, and it was like the chemistry was there immediately. He knew exactly what I was talking about, even though I couldn't really explain it and stuff like that. And from then on, we went over his house like every day and was just, I created that whole He's So Crazy Martin album in that closet at Kev's house. Mm -hmm. um, and we're just trying to figure uh, our, ourselves out as an artist. Like we're trying to figure out what we were doing right, keep on doing that, what we were doing wrong, we need to fix that and what we can capitalize on. And from then the friendship was just genuine and then we decided we needed to do, we needed something big, like we needed to make a name for ourselves. 
So the only place we could actually perform was over Philly. Anytime we go over Philly, we just wanted to shut it down. It used to be, we'll bring like three people, next time five, 10, 15. Like they started seeing what it was becoming over Philly. Like every time we come over Philly, it was like, all right, they from Jersey. We trying to really support Philly artists because Philly was like in a downswing at that time. It was like at a real downswing as far as like Philly artists. And they were trying to, they, as you should, like you're trying to support your own and really make the next Philly artist pop. So us being from Jersey, we're kind of overlooked, like, all right, let them get their stage time and then let's see what's popping with whoever's from like locally. But we went over there with the attitude like, all right, we might not be from here, but we got to be here. And y'all going to respect the 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes we got on this stage. And we just had so much energy and so much. It wasn't like negative aggression. It was just like, we're here to get lit. And if you don't fuck with it, then fuck it. Because you got 10 minutes of watching us get lit if you're not going to get lit with us. And all our homies would be right there up front. We ain't really believe in bringing all our homies on stage because we feel like if y'all got that same energy in the crowd, it makes our set look that much more lit. So Smart. we were just doing that for like probably like two years. And it was slowly taking over uh, every little small venue that you got Philly into the medium sized venues. And it was like we we're getting notoriety. Off How were you getting people out to the shows? Like I think it, I think it played a major role in we, we do a lot of crowd interaction. Like I said, the energy and our videos from the shows would go locally viral, not viral viral, but like locally it was like, damn, we ain't go to that. I got to check him out next time he has a show. So it was kind of like every time we go out, we had a video to post. If you missed it, it was like you fucked up because it looked crazier than the last one. And it was like you weren't seeing that from especially not a South Jersey artist. But at the time in Philly, you weren't seeing that from an underground artist. I think Uzi was he was out of here by this point, but he wasn't mainstream as he is now so like he was on the brink of like i'm not doing these type of shows anymore but that was the guy at the point and it was like we were just trying to build our own jersey scene in philly because we don't have a scene to actually even build in jersey there's like there's no venues there's nowhere for you to get your shit off so you got to go to philly and you got to make the best of it and it was like we met a lot of cool philly artists and pretty much a lot of people after a while people thought we were from here like if you if you I didn't from here for a second. yeah like if you didn't actually follow the movement and understand what the south side was and all of that then it was like you would have thought we were from here and it was just a it was a beautiful thing to just start embracing us and I always got love for Philly just for that yeah because I was gonna say like how did how do you feel like Philly helped your the, like the growth of your fan base I feel like if it wasn't for Philly then we're pretty pretty much still being square one like. Um, we go to places like New York, they always talk about if you can perform in New York and they fuck with you in New York, then you good. Like, New York is a tough crowd, but I go to New York and they say, if you could perform in Philly, then you good, because Philly's a tough crowd. But I feel like we, every time we went out, it was never really like, man, get these niggas off stage, man. It was never that type of energy because, I don't know, we had a different type of charisma about how we went about our shit. It was like we were showing up to work. Yeah, we'll have fun and all that shit, but when it was time to go on stage, it was like, we're trying to deliver y'all a show. Like we're getting paid millions to be up on this ethic table. Like wherever we're at, like we didn't give a fuck where we was at. Small stage, big stage, no stage. It was like, we were going to give you what you, either you paid for or what the promoter booked us for. We're going to give you that, won't care who's in the building. And um, they respected that. So once we started getting those bigger shows, it was like, this is where they belong. Like this is where I, I envisioned how they would, how they would act once they got this type of opportunity. And Philly just, a lot of my fans are just from Philly. Like, I feel like Philly was on board Amir Fontaine before South Jersey really started getting the hang of it. And it wasn't until I started doing the shows in Philly that South Jersey was like, who's this Amir Fontaine kid? And then it's like, oh, he's from around here. Oh, that's even better. Now I got to go to Philly to go check him out. And it just started blowing up from that. So when did you link with, like, John and Veli? And for those who don't know, who are they? John and Veli are both of my managers. I've known John since I was in elementary school. We went to the same elementary school together. Um, but we kind of like lost contact between middle school and high school. And we kind of rekindled it uh, while he was in Syracuse. And I was going to Rutgers. Um, I was doing my, my one, two out here. I was just rapping and stuff out here. And John was going to school for PR and uh, like artist management and stuff like that. So it was kind of like we were both learning how to do our lane at the same time. <clears throat> and I think that was kind of the reason why I trusted John with my career so early. Um, I had no manager, I had nothing really going on for me. I just wanted to make music at that point. I had nothing, I had no knowledge of the business aspect, none of that. I was just 
I'm going to rap stories and rap circles, rapidly rap. Like, I was just rapidly rap. Before Melody, I was scared to sing because I'm from Camden and all. I'm not trying to be an R&B singer. Y'all going to get these bars. Y'all going to get these raps, these stories. Y'all going to get all of that. But it was like, as I evolved as an artist, John got more knowledge in his in his field. And once he graduated, he had more time to actually focus on, on me and what we were going to do together as a team. And Veli came aboard. Veli was already doing his thing in Philly. Like, he was doing all the shows and stuff in Philly. Veli took notice of what we were doing because, like I said, we were pretty much shutting down all these shows in Philly. Um, I think John could tell you how that... <laughs> it, it's a great area that I wasn't a part of. I, could, I think John could tell you about how that whole... How, that, how him and Veli got together. But um, as the artist, I, I always respected Veli for what he was doing. Like, I didn't see anybody else in Philly that was really, like, trying to take a, a hold of the scene as far as, like, shows. Like, yo, I'm going to just keep on bringing these people out. I'm going to pay the bread to bring these people out and then give you all this opportunity. So I respected that. And um, and then Veli just pretty much, as far as I remember, Veli came up one day, or it was a text message, or it was something, and he just asked to be a part of the team. And I was all for it. John was for it. And it was just like, yo, it's going to be crazy if we really do what I really envision that we have the potential to do. And ever since then, it's probably been like two, three years and we've just been rocking out. Um, he's helped me get on tours. Um, we've been selling out shows. It's just been like a gradual rise and it's just been, it's just been like a journey. Like, So talk to me about that gradual rise. So like, what was the plan? You know what I mean? Like, what did you guys focus on to get the traction? Um, we focused on a lot of different stuff because it was never really no right answer. Like we were trying to figure out what the right answer was. Um, we figured out that we can pretty much just sell out Philly shows. Like we stopped doing as much Philly shows. So it was more so about expanding our growth in our, in our audience. So we started doing smaller tours, put me on smaller tours, whether it be somebody else's tour or I was just going on tour on my own. Cause I had a big fan, a fan following over here, but I still got sporadic fans everywhere else across the nation. What was the first tour? Wasn't it like a Black Balloon tour? Black Balloon tour was the very first tour we ever did. It was probably like four cities and it was only like on the East Coast. It was like DC and Baltimore and places that I wasn't really hitting because I stayed like in the tri-state area. Um, that went over well. Then we did the part two of the Black Balloon tour. Like um, we We're in like Boston, Connecticut, those type of places and stuff like that. Um, we're just really focusing on expanding the Mayor Fontaine brand. Like, and at that point, we felt like you, you're you not going to believe until you see it. Like, you really got to come out to a show and see it because we can't explain it to you. So we were just trying to reach as many cities as we, as we could, whether the show be sold out or it be like 30 people in there. Y'all going to see or get an introduction to Mayor Fontaine. You got to go through them uh, rough shows in places that you're not from and stuff like that. But like, what kept me going is that those shows, whether they be big or small, it was always people there to like, tell me how much they appreciated the music, they wanted pictures and stuff like that. I'm like, yo, I never stepped foot over here in my life and y'all know about me and, and actually embrace what I'm talking about. So that had to be a dope feeling. Yeah, it's, every time it's a dope feeling because it's like, I, it's still places I haven't gone yet that they're telling or asking me to come to. And I know it's going to be crazy once I go out there and really just see all these fans that support me and stuff like that. And did I'm you, just... Did you have a moment where it was just like, oh shit, like I'm actually... I'm doing, I'm really doing this shit. Um, <laughs> really making an impact. It's been a couple of moments like that, but I want to say the biggest moment was when we we sold out the foundry for the macaroni show and I got in that water raft and was held up by all those fans. That's That was the moment where it was like, this is out of control at this point. This is, this is crazy. Um, it was that. A uh, fan hit me up and told me that they played me daily in Jamaica on the radio. And I'm like, I've never been to Jamaica in my life. That's, <laughs> that's wild. Um, what else is crazy? We did a Sweet 16 one time. I Very first Sweet 16 anyway. I did. So I don't know how this is gonna go. We <laughs> walk in, we don't walk in through the back. Cause we don't know, like I said, it's the first time we do it. We don't know how we're supposed, what's the protocol how to actually do this. So it's all these kids in the front. Imagine this is the front door and all the kids are right here. And it's like steps and it's a balcony and the birthday girl's on the balcony, but all the kids are partying down here. As we walk in through the front door, all the kids' backs are turned to us, but we're walking through, and it's kind of like, I guess because they see the camera, uh, my, my cameraman and stuff. Probably two kids turn around, two kids turn to four, four turns into six, and then it's just like, then you gradually hear it go, <laughs> and I'm just, it's like deafening loud, and it's like, I didn't know, I didn't realize that they seen me yet, cause I'm trying to stay low. I had my hoodie on. 
I did. I thought we were going to go to a back room. I didn't know we were going to walk through the party and then actually just get right to it. So they start going crazy. And then I look up and I see how many kids it is. And we walking up the spiral staircase and I look down and I really see how many kids it is because you can see over top and stuff. That was one of the moments where I'm just like, yeah, this is wild. Because we never really sought out to get a white fan base. I never thought it was going to come that way. I thought it was going to be like, you got to eventually get to that because the way my content was. But it was like, I realized I make music that that's palatable for anybody to really digest or take from whatever they want to take from. Like Down by the River touches anybody, any age group, any race, nationality, wherever you come from. Like to this day, people talk about this song that dropped two years ago. And it's crazy to me. Somebody told me about it earlier. Like that's wild that it's when still I around. Because like, yeah, you know? yeah, we don't like we don't put no me. money behind that song no more. We don't promote it, none of that. So for it to still be a cult, same thing with Space Jam. We about to shoot the Space Jam video. So for people to still be excited for those type of songs, those are the reason why I continue to make music. Because it's like it's truly timeless, and I feel like I'm gonna be one of those people that, um, you know, you got those artists um, that you remember that from middle school. They're gonna remember. Uh, they're gonna define middle school days, like Jay Quan or somebody. Like, you think of those type of people uh, uh, during your middle school or your high school mm -hmm. days, like, you're always gonna uh, have that theme song for that, that time in your life. I wanna be one of those people that can make theme music for different times in people's lives that they're gonna remember any of these songs 10 years from now, 15 years What's from now. What's your favorite song of yours? My favorite song of mine? Um, I like Frank Ocean, just because That's it was like so outside of the box for me. It was like, Cause I went from not wanting to sing at all, and it's a personal message, and it's, I feel like it's an area that artists don't talk about at all, like that insecure, like how come y'all aren't as into me as you are into my peers or the people that I'm actually competing against. Um, even though you may be family or friends, but you show more interest in these other people. Like nobody actually makes those type of songs or talks on that subject. Um, and I think the way I did it just, it was really well. I, I surprised myself when I did that song. Yeah, I love that song. It's one of my personal favorites. Um, back to something that you said a minute ago. So, like, you said you stopped putting money into that one song. So, mm -hmm. what did you guys actually, like, put money into? As far as, like, like that, for any artist, like, what's it important to put money into? You definitely got to put money into actually making sure your visual is dope. You got to pay for the video to actually be dope. We put money into uh, actually making sure it, it touches the audience that it's supposed to touch. Um... At the time we were signed the uh, 300 so they made sure that when the video pops up it's put in like we we're trying to get a new york fan base so the new york they'll make sure the new york audience sees the video you know what i mean because we're trying to build more of a uh, like a name out out in these different areas you want to make sure that uh your props during the shows and stuff is 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 up to notch like the actual presentation of the song itself that we put behind down by the river from the raft, from all of those things, like, that's what I mean by time, effort, money, all those things have to go into a single in order for it to fly. Like, a lot of people put two weeks into promoting the song and then be on to the next one. And it's like, that one didn't really reach the massive potential of people or ears that it could have. So, yeah. Definitely. What's, uh, on your busiest day, like, what does that look like? Busiest day, we probably got photo shoot, we got interviews, we probably in New York somewhere. Um, we got studio sessions. I'm trying to paint a picture of the hustle. Like, you got, all right, if I had to paint it out step by step, you gotta wake up early, you gotta drive to Secaucus, New Jersey, you gotta catch that train to New York, you gonna be in Penn Station, you gonna catch a lift to wherever you got the interview session, whatever you're doing out there. And if you go into New York, more than likely, you're not going out there for one thing. So you got several stops to make out there. And it's an all day thing. It's, a, it's nonstop music. Like you're just surrounded by music. It's not just sitting and writing a song. It's more so about meeting new people behind the scenes who can uh, give you input on what you could be doing to help better further your career, better further your chances of reaching the people that you want to reach. And um, yeah, every day you got to learn something. It's because the music industry, I learned that is way deeper than just recording. It's way deeper than just giving it to the fans and receiving the feedback and all the praise and all that other stuff. Like you actually have to, it's a lot of work that goes into even putting the work out. Like, and when I first started, like John to tell you, I was very impatient because I always wanted to 
like like I got a kind of a high from releasing music and having people tell me like yo I needed that I needed to hear that because when I'm writing it I don't look at it that way but I know once I put it out somebody's gonna grab this and they're gonna be like yo I'm glad you did this because I did Space Jam it was just like all right I need a song for the ladies I didn't know Space Jam was just something like like they was gonna feel it so much and, and to this day really be anticipating the video we dropped that two years ago and you gotta learn to be patient. You gotta learn that timing. Like a lot of stuff is timing. It's a song that I want to drop uh, on this next album that we can't drop because the time is not right for it. Um, it gotta be a little warmer weather. We waited too long for it, but. But damn, so that's crazy. So you dropped Space Jam two years ago, and you shoot a video for it then. Yep. It survived two years. Yeah. People still tweeting it. They telling me that's a mood, um, and it never got a visual. So if it's just surviving this long off of streams and word of mouth, imagine what it do. It's about to hit a million and I haven't made a visual for it. And it was never a single either. It was just like, it was a part of the album. Uh, I think it did drop as a single, probably like a, a couple of days before we dropped the, the actual Who's Watching the Kids project. But it never really had no legs. We never really pushed that as something that we want to be, this has got to be big, this has got to be big. We didn't treat it like a bodega or anything like that. So. I don't know how deep you can get with stuff like this, but I know you had some issues on the business side, dealing with label situations and stuff like that. Can you maybe tell, if you can't talk about it, <laughs> can you maybe uh, talk about, you know, some of the bullshit maybe on the industry side? Can we talk about it, John? Or maybe not mention who it was or what it uh, was. The exactly, bullshit with, like, with the labels? Uh, you know what I was saying, maybe. All right, well, it's a lot of bullshit with the label. Um, so this specific label, I can't even say that because I've only been signing with you. But, well, it's a lot of bullshit. You, you don't have to gear it towards like, uh, you don't have to all right, say All right, well, with labels, you got you to gotta be careful with labels because labels, as as I thought, they uh, I thought that they really wanted the best for you as an artist. Like, they really don't. Though. They really want the bottom line. They want the bottom dollar. Um, some of the bullshit I encountered with labels, when I first got signed, they thought I was, uh, like a, one of those, I'm gonna make a hit song, let's just milk, let's milk how much we can get out of this song, because after that, is he's not gonna make another one. They didn't know that I was an actual complete artist who can make bodies of work. It was, it was like an old shit moment, we gotta, we gotta keep this. But they didn't did so much bullshit before then it turns you off to even want to do anything business-wise any further or give them any more money. So I learned as an independent artist, well, first of all, when you're signed to a label, you get paid twice a year. For the rest of the year, you gotta figure that shit out. So you get paid pretty much like twice a year, but when you're independent, that money comes way faster because everything is coming directly to you. You don't have to wait on anybody to sign your checks or none of that. Um, I'm just about to get paid from Camden, like everything I'm supposed to get. Um, and you just have way more freedom. You don't have to deal with, uh, worrying about when people want you to drop you. Uh, you, you always feel like you're the priority when you're by yourself, when you're independent, you never have to worry about, uh, if the label is going to push or promote the way that you think they are, like the way that they will push, uh, a higher echelon artist like uh, Migos or somebody like that, like the whole Instagram push, you'll get a a whole media run, they'll lay it out for you. Like none of that really happened uh, for me. It was more so mainly just, just distribution. They'll try to uh, um, say you do a record with one of their artists. They'll try to get you, like I left the label, I uh, dropped the album on my own. And I had these songs with an artist that was signed to the label I just left. But they wouldn't let me release the songs unless I signed back to the label to drop those songs. And then they wanted the option to keep me to drop an album after the songs. So it was like a whole bunch of... It was a, it was a whole bunch of stuff going on. So was it different? Different? Did you have initially before you went into it, did you like 
have a different expectation, I guess. Initially, like, I feel like everybody expects you to walk in there and be like, oh, we want to sign you, blah, 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 blah. It's an all white room. They got the champagne bottles ready. They got the contract on the table for you. Sign is the big party. They lay out the whole thing, everything that they want as far as like a rollout that they got planned for you. They got all of this money behind you because they believe in you, your music, and your story. That's not how it is at all. Like, they could care less, I feel like. Especially because of the streaming stuff and they're not sure how they can make money off of this. They're like, they're going to really try to make their money as quick as possible before I feel like all of this is even, like, valid, validated. Because there's really no rules to the streaming shit right now. And until they figure that shit out, they're going to make as much money as they can right now. And, like, and most of that shit, that shit's like Wild Wild West because a lot of that shit be bought by the labels. If they choose to do that, which I, it, which is another reason why I'd rather just kind of fall back from it. It's a lot of trickery that they try to do with certain artists. Um, so do you like being independent? I do like the free, the freedom of being independent, but I feel like if you do want to sign to a label, there's benefits of like actually having a backing of people who, uh, <laughs> like if they really support in what you're doing and they really have an understanding of who you are as an artist, then they'll give you connections that they have to certain outlets that would benefit you as an artist. Like like I said, I, I do art, I draw, I do, I'll game, I do stuff like that. But it was like, it's certain ways that I can do all of that and have it bring it back to the music. And it's like, none of those ideas or things that I would suggest were coming back, but I know I could do that if I was independent. But it was kind of like we had strings attached to other things that kind of stopped us from being able to do stuff. You can't, you can't create your own release date. Kinda, kinda. When you're working with a label, it's like, I don't know. It's like a, it's, it's like when you're in a relationship. It's no longer you no more. It's, it's, it's us. Like everything has to be kind of like compromised, as opposed to even though you might know what's best for you and what's best for everything that you created. Once you, once you're married, it, it has to become like we both agreed on to do this. Even if you might not like this date, I feel like we should do this date. Sometimes you can meet in the middle. Sometimes it's like, nah, I really feel like we should do this because we got the money and we're going to do this thing. So it's better to really just be your own guy. At least for as long as you can, I guess. It's for as long as you can. And then if anything, like get yourself your own label, sign yourself to like 10 albums. So if anybody, any other label wants parts of what you got going on, they have to go through the, your label and they have to get permission from whoever runs your label, AKA you. And then y'all do a partnership for X amount of albums because you're already signed to so many albums from yourself. If y'all want four or three, you gotta cut this check and, and do this partnership with XXX uh, Records, whatever, whatever it's called. So it's, it's just smarter ways that you can do it because I feel like the climate of labels and stuff like that right now is real shaky unless you find a really good label or um, not even just a really good label, you need a lot, you need a good a &R. you need a good team behind you, like everybody behind you has to be solid and really for you, otherwise it gets shaky when they want it to get shaky, you know what I mean, yeah. so. So one thing that I, you've done an amazing job at is like staying in touch with your fans, for like sure. really being active, can you talk a little bit about that? I feel like as long as you can talk directly to your fans, you really don't even need per se a label. Because you're, the whole point is to get your music to your fans. And if you, and we have social media now, so I can actually talk directly to my fans. I have a way where if you signed up for it, I can call my fans directly. I can FaceTime, speak directly to the people that I'm trying to talk to and trying to sell my product to. Um, that's very important. And I feel like that they appreciate that. Because I know when I was younger, before I was famous or whatever, I always thought it would, it would be so dope if my favorite artist or my favorite uh, singer actually replied to me or engaged in a conversation or, or anything like that. But it was like, either one, it was at a point where that was impossible or two, most of the celebrities are too stuck up or too busy to even talk to the people that they want to spend money on them. Um, that's very, very important to keep in touch with your fans. You need to know what they want what they what they need right now from you if you were to ever fall off your fans are the first ones to tell you if they didn't like the album like 
like some people would take that as an attack. I feel like if I were to drop a trash album, my fans would let me know, like, yo, I don't know about this one. Like, maybe you kind of got go back to this. You know what I mean? Because we liked when you did this on this album. Go back to this sound. We're not bashing because they still want to be there for you. You know what I mean? But they was here since I was nothing, and they they're going to be here until the end, as long as you keep in touch with them, and as long as you actually. It's pretty much like you're holding their hand through the journey. So when I blow up, they feel like they blow up too. Every time I do anything big or when I got made in America, they felt like they got made in America. Mm -hmm. Like, and that's just how I wanted that relationship with my fans to always be. Yeah, because what really what was amazing to me was when you were sitting there like calling them. Yeah. That'd be cool. Can you do that right now? Can I do it right now? <laughs> I could. Why um, not? <laughs> you could. Let me see. Cause I, I think that's so dope. And like their reaction. And you know, the way we gotta do it, it's like if I call him, it's gonna call you. Yeah, then you answer. Uh, and then you just sit on it. Okay, hold up. I mean, yeah, if it's not too much trouble, I just thought it would be cool for the interview. Just connect it to this one. Right. Right. Sure. You got you got to sit on your phone? You gotta love being on the joint. So it's pretty much like they give me a separate phone number, and through that separate phone number, I'm able to contact or text back any of them. Um, it was uh, it was one fan, it was probably like the last fan we did, and she was just going through a lot. And we just called her up, you know what I mean? She talked about what she was going through with her family and stuff. And, oh, so um, you actually had like full blown conversations? We didn't put that one in the video, but it's like, yeah. stuff like that, like people actually need somebody to talk to. So if I'm talking to you through my music and I could talk to you actually personally, and actually see what's going on. You can save somebody's life like that. Like I feel like I would feel like shit if one of my fans just felt like they had nobody to talk to, and that service is right there though. And they just decide it, they're just alone, and they just take their own life. That that would just like, you know what I mean. So I just feel like at a certain point the fans are almost like family. So when they held me up on the raft, that meant a lot to me. Cause I was always scared to uh, crowd surf. Even when uh, like the shows out here started getting big, it was like, yo, why you crowd surf doing Wani Wag? Why you, yo, they go crazy doing Wani Wag? I'm like, listen, cause I don't, I feel like they're gonna drop me or they're gonna move out the way. Like, who you think you is? Like, you know what I mean? We fuck with you, we don't fuck with you, you know what I mean? So I ain't wanna embarrass myself. So I was just like, when I feel like it, when I feel like it's time, then I'm gonna do it. And once we sold out that show by myself, we had no openers, everybody was there just for me. I was like, I don't think nobody here would drop me or wants to see me fall on my face. So when we just did it, that, that meant a lot to me. Yeah, that was dope. You uh, almost there over there? <laughs> just use my phone. All right, cause your phone about to die. Mm, let me find somebody that just texted me. All right, so pretty much this is all my fans. This is. We delete like we deleted a lot of thread. The shit it was like over fourteen hundred people in text message threads. All right, so let's call let's call Xavier Mendez. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> you. Yo, this is Mayor Fontaine. <laughs> this is Mayor Fontaine. You can hear me? This is Xavier. This is Mayor Fontaine. Hell yeah. FaceTime you? You don't believe me. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, hold on, let me see if I can do that. I'm FaceTime you right now. <laughs> so we're about to look forward now. 
<laughs> Ain't coming through? Give me an eye cloud? How you do that? Alright, yeah, just do that. <laughs> Alright, let's see. You said that, John? Yeah. Hold up, hold up. You want me to fucking write it down? Hey, yo. <laughs> See if the face on went through. It went through. <laughs> Yo, he ain't trying to do that. Damn, bro. All right, bro, I was trying to get you in the motherfucking interview, cuz. <laughs> so I was trying to get you in this interview, cuz. Yeah. Appreciate it, bro. All right. Millville? All right, Millville, stand up. <laughs> All right, bro. You too. Yeah, this is funny. Oh man, he had to plug himself out. He had to. <laughs> oh man, no, that shit is genius, though. I love that you do that. I feel like that's amazing, uh, and and that's why he's been able to, you know, really, really grow as an indie artist. I think that's just amazing. Um, so I mean, it's been a minute, so. We can start to wrap it up, but like, so I guess last but not least, like, where, where do you see this going? What's? I feel like right now we're doing everything right. Um, I'm making a lot of, a lot of the right moves. When I first started out, like, if you can, you can go back and listen to any of my projects, I never really had a lot of features, unless I knew you personally. Like, you probably hear Ishan Cad and stuff like that, but I never really was a fan of features, cause I was so meticulous about my art. Like, if I feel like you weren't gonna add to it or nothing like that. I wasn't going to be on no clout chasing shit or nothing like that. So it was like, I would rather just make this song by myself because my voice is already versatile. And plus I, I could do the singing, I could do the rap, I could do the rap, I could do the melody, I could do all that myself. So I always wanted to showcase that. But um, I feel like everything that we're doing now, um, we making the right uh, connections, I'm building the right relationships. It's a lot of genuinely cool uh, new rappers that's in the game right now. Um, I feel like, we're going in a, in a crazy direction right now because I feel like by me leaving the label, we just got our power back. Um, the ideas is flowing. Uh, the fans are waiting for their new music. I don't have to give this this album to a label now. Um, we about to just go crazy. I just feel like uh, this year is going to be the year that I really break out and really like start reaching where I really want to reach. Start hitting the West Coast and stuff like that. So, uh, final, final question. I always ask everybody this. Uh, what Are you a taste creator and what does that mean to you? What is a taste creator? I'm definitely a taste creator. I feel like a taste creator is somebody that creates what, um, what's actually, it's gonna sound cheesy, what's the flavor of the month? What's the flavor of the year? Like what's really, what's really the thing that everybody can agree is hot or can agree is, for lack of better word, saucy. You know what I mean? I feel like a taste creator is somebody that's a leader, somebody that steps outside the box, somebody that creates his own lane and then that lane becomes 
a lane. Like, you know what I mean? That lane becomes something that somebody else one day is going to follow and modify, customize, and it's going to, they're going to reach back and be like, yo, if it wasn't for this person trying this thing out, you know what I mean, or creating this new idea, this new way of thinking, then this wouldn't be possible for this person or that person. I feel like the taste creators create all of that. Yeah.